Hey there, my name is Jimmy Allen. I'm the pastor here at Woodbine Church, and I'm so glad that you have joined us for this evening's service. Uh, you are helping to make history. We've never done four Christmas Eve services ever before, and y'all are the last of the four. So we are just excited that y'all are a part of that, and uh, thank you so much for being a part of this service this evening. Uh, we want to um, share with you in just a few moments, you're going to be needing a um, candle for our candlelight service and for if you do, do not have one and would like one if you could just raise your hand we have some folks in the back that would be glad to bring you one so if you just leave keep your hand up until they see you if you need one uh, they'll be glad to bring it to you um, <clears throat> but uh, we again we're just so thankful to have you here as a part of this service this evening as we get to celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ so I want to invite you if you will will you pray with me for a moment let's pray together God, thank you so much for everything you do. You're so loving, so powerful, so gracious, so kind. We thank you so much for the opportunity to celebrate tonight in this service. We thank you that we can celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just work in every part of this service. I pray that we would honor you in all parts of it, in everything that we do, through the singing, the praying, the preaching, everything, that we would point people to you. So, Father, we give you thanks today for everything, especially for Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. If you will, let's stand as we continue in the service. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. And the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous dream. Westward leading still proceeds 
Oh, I heard somebody sound like Santa Claus out there. That was awesome. You guys, we're so excited to have you here just to kind of uh, echo what Jimmy's already said. We're, we're welcoming you guys to this Christmas Eve service, and what a glorious Christmas this is. It's been a tough year, but we still get to celebrate the birth of our Savior, and no matter what, what's tough, right, in the year, we are already victorious because God sent Jesus for us. So this next song that we're going to, amen is right. And this next song we're going to do is I've really come to love it this Christmas season. And, you know, the Bible tells us in several places about how creation cries out in praise to, the, to our Father, right? And this song is it's called Hey Moon, and it basically gives an idea of what creation may have felt like on the night that Jesus was born. It's funny how time just flies Yesterday we were just kids Hanging in the sky Staying up all night Hey, hey moon Do you ever get a tear in your eye? When you think about the time that God came down I couldn't help myself had to shine so bright and I remember that newborn baby and the wise men that traveled so far it's when I knew I was made for a reason I feel like the luckiest star hey moon That's the first time you've heard that song. Anybody? 
Uh, wow, a lot. Well, I'm glad that Chrissy and the team got a chance to introduce you to that song from Sidewalk Prophets. It's a wonderful song. Uh, so I'm so glad y'all got to hear that. That is a beautiful song. Uh, I want to share with you a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, every Christmas Eve we do a couple of things that are, have become a tradition here at Woodbine. One you're going to see in a few minutes, but one I need to talk to you about right now. Uh, every year at Christmas we receive an offering. Now, not a penny of that money goes to the church. Not a penny of that stays here. Every penny that we take goes to a children's home that we sponsor. This children's home does a lot of work to help out families that are in need. Their goal is to reunite families that, uh, you know, may have had some trouble where the children and the parents have had to be separated for a while, and they hope to bring healing to the family and bring them back together. In some instances, that's not possible. So what happens is those those children are either put into foster care that uh, this children's home helps to place them in foster care. This children's children's home also trains foster parents to help care for the children, uh, and not just their children, but they help for in the whole foster system. So they do a lot of work there. And then there are some times when the children do not have parents anymore, and they help to place them in their forever home or help to care for them. If they can't find a placement, they care for them all the way up until they get into college. So uh, it's a very important ministry. Every penny we receive goes to, uh, on the Christmas Eve offerings goes to that children's home for their ministry. And what I want to share with you is the way you can give an offering tonight. We don't pass the baskets right now, but the way you can give an offering tonight, Autumn Truesdale uh, is right over here. She put together a box for us that we have been using. And that box, you can see it as you're getting ready to go out the doors, out, go outside. There's, it's sitting on the table there, has children's home on it. She did a great job decorating it up and all of that. But everything that we receive in that offering, like I said, will go to the children's home. And I appreciate Autumn doing that for us. Um, she volunteered, too. It didn't even have to chase her down or anything. So thank you, Autumn. We appreciate that. Uh, but what... Um, If you would like to give an offering that way at the end of the service, you're welcome to do that. If you would like to give online, there's a way you can do that. There is this little QR code that's somewhere in the seats near you. You can scan with your smartphone that QR code. When you scan that, it will carry you to several links. One of the links is a giving link. And uh, you can give an offering that will go towards that. Just put down Children's Home as you fill out the the little... uh, thing on your phone. Uh, The form. There you go. That's what it is. Um, And uh, that way, every every bit of that goes to help out the the children's home. Um, So I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Um, There's another thing uh, after this service or throughout the next few few nights, if you haven't experienced it yet, there's a drive-through nativity. Uh, it's all, the story is told with banners. It's all on the back part of our property. Start over here, and you can just make a loop all the way around our property. We would love to have you to, to do that. There is on each one of the signs there is a um, a web address. You go to that web address. You can play that um, little video that's on there, and it'll give you the scriptures. It'll talk about the scriptures that relate to each one of those 15 banners. It takes about five minutes to ride through. It's not very long, but if you can't do it tonight, find the night and the next few nights to do it, and check out a a telling of the Christmas story in that way. So we hope you'll join us uh, with that. Uh, Now, I would like for us to uh, spend just a moment in prayer, and then uh, we'll continue in the service. Uh, Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for blessing us in so many ways. Thank you for the ministry of the children's home and how they they reach out to help hurting families and help children in need, to help them either be reunited with their families and for those who don't have a family, help them find one. I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with them in their ministry. I pray that you take the offering that we're sending in and that other churches across uh, our conference are sending in that they would take that offering and use it for your glory, Father, and that they, they would be used to tell these kids about Jesus and these families about Jesus. And also, Lord, we just pray that you take the offering and multiply it because we know the needs are great to help hurting families. We are reminded you're the first and the greatest giver, and we give you thanks for all the blessings you give to us, and we thank you for giving us an opportunity to partner with you in this ministry to these children. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in the service. 
I said that we've got a couple of uh, traditions that we do on uh, Christmas Eve, and here is the second tradition that we do, and that is a live, spontaneous nativity scene. So uh, it's always fun, or at least it's fun for me. I'm sure it's fun for y'all, too. I know the kids have a ball. So what I'm going to do, if you've never been a part of this, let me kind of explain it real quick. Uh, we already have some kids that have dressed up to be a part of it. I'm looking out, and I'm seeing some Marys and some angels and some others out there. If you didn't dress up, that's okay. Kids, if you still want to be a part of it, you can still do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the story the, from Luke 2. As I get to a different parts of the story, 
I will pause and say, hey, uh, all my Josephs come up here, all my Marys come up here, or the angels, or whatever. And at the end, if it's not included in the story, I'll get to everybody, trust me. So what I, I would like to invite you to do is as we read that, uh, just get ready. If, even if you're not dressed up in a costume, you're still welcome to be a part of this, kids. So <clears throat> let's get started. In Luke chapter 2, we're going to begin with a, this is one of my favorite passages um, that I read every year. I read it a lot, and I just enjoy this. In Luke 2, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Let me stop right there. I'm not going to ask for Quirinius or anybody. All right. Uh, but what I am going to say, I forgot to say this, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, at the end, if you want to take a picture, there will be plenty of time to do that. We'll get them up here, get them in place, everybody will be in it, and then I'll let you know when the Kodak moment hits, okay? So I just want to make sure all of y'all knew that. I forgot to say that a minute ago. Now I'll start over. So, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Do we have any Josephs out there? Oh, oh did I hear somebody in the back saying yes? Who's volunteering? I think Drew is volunteering is what I heard. So I got to have a Joseph. We can't have a nativity without a Joseph. And uh, oh, we got a Joseph. Outstanding. Boy, you're the youngest Joseph. We got two. Whoa. I just played a sour note. Okay, come on up here, buddy. Okay. Come on up here, Connor. You're going to be right back over here. All right, big man. Right there. Stand right there. Can you move over just a little bit more? Okay. That was a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he stepped a little bit. Hang right there, okay? You good? He says, as long as my pappy does not let go of my hand, I'm great. All right. I got to turn the page. Hold on a second. Hold on to my pocket. All right. <laughs> All right. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. How many Marys do we have out there? Come on down. All right. We got at least one, and they have a baby Jesus. All right. Outstanding. If you'll sit right here, Joseph is getting as close to you as he can, I guess. <laughs> Perfect. All right. We got him. Any other Marys? Okay. Don't want to leave anybody out. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Do we have any baby Jesuses out there? We had at the last service the youngest baby Jesus I ever remember us having, a two-week-old. So that was pretty cool. We've had them older than that, and that's pretty cool too. Any baby Jesuses? She has one she brought with her, but we don't want to leave anybody out. Okay. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. All right, do we have any shepherds out there? One? I heard somebody say one. All right. Oh, we got some shepherds coming on down. All right, all right. <laughs> I like the enthusiasm. Preston, come stand right over here. All right. Joseph isn't leaving my, arm, my side right now. You good, big man. Got another one. Come on in, buddy. Come stand right here. Can you do that? I may have to be in the picture this year. <laughs> Me and Joseph. Oh, another shepherd. Come on. Can you make it? Oh. You good? Can somebody? Yeah. I'm kind of stranded. Okay, good. Come on over here. Perfect. Come here. Come here, Abigail. Can you stand right there? That is perfect. That's probably our, our smallest shepherd we've ever had. Yeah. All right. Good job. All right, no, it's not. Oh, somebody's questioning whether or not they're going to come. Okay. All right, now, all, is that all our shepherds? Okay. If he decides in a minute he wants to, it's all good, too. So, all right. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. I think there's some angels out there. I can see a few of them. So come on down, angels, all of them. Man, we've got... Oh, okay. We... Uh, if you... You want to stand over by Drew right over there? It's quite unexpected. You want to stand right here? Sit, sit down right there. That's perfect. You can sit right there. And you want to stand right here by me? Come on over. Come on over. All right. I was not expecting some of that. Okay. That, that's what this is. It's live and unexpected. Okay. Any other angels? All right. <laughs> when the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So he hurried off, they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. All right. Now, there are some things that aren't mentioned here, but we know that were there that night. Like, there were some animals. I mean, we've had all kinds of animals. We've had sheep and had a camel at one service. Any, any animals out there? Okay. No animals at this service. That's all right. Uh, the second question then, uh, we also know that there was a star. Any stars out there? Yes. Yes. Somebody said, oh, here we go. All right. If they can come. Oh, this is, Yeah. Everybody can come on up. It's all right. Come on up. It's not only a star. Yeah, somebody said it's a constellation. That's okay. That's all right. Come on up. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, she will. We have a star. Oh, we got a couple more coming down. Come on down. Okay, that's probably. Oh, there's a couple more I wasn't expecting. All right, come on down. All y'all stars, we have a constellation that we're working on now. If y'all want to stand right here, can y'all come over here? Stand right here. Perfect. Can y'all stand right there? Slide over just a little bit more. Perfect, perfect. All right. A little bit later in the story, we also know that there were some wise men, right? Do we have any wise men out there? Oh, got a wise man. He's a dual role. That's okay. We got a dual role. Any wise men? All right, we had our first wise woman at the first service. So, all right. Well, all right. We have our live nativity. And uh, I would normally get out of the picture, but I can't exactly do that this time. Uh, but what I would like to invite you to do, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, if you'd like to take a picture, move out of your seat, get over here where you can get a good one, and take a picture of this great nativity scene. So, ready? Stand right here. Slide over a little bit, buddy. This way. Okay, can you see everybody? All right. Feel free to move around anywhere you want to. The little shepherd girl? Okay, well, Abigail, can you step right over here so they can see you? Perfect. Right there. Stand right there. And then hold on a second. Okay. How's that? Can we see everybody now? Those of you who can Photoshop, take me out of the picture. It's a floating Joseph. Okay. We got it? Y'all have, take all the pictures you want. All 
All right. I tell you what, let's thank this wonderful nativity scene. All right? Let's thank these all, all these folks. All right. Woohoo! Y'all all did great. Y'all can go back to your seats now, okay? Be careful. Come on, I'll try to help y'all down as many as I can. All right. Let me drop you right down here, buddy. Good job. Ah, there you go. You got it? Y'all need some help? Y'all got it? Look at that. Uh oh. Outstanding. Thank you all for participating. Thank y'all all for your encouragement with these beautiful, beautiful children up here. And some not so children up here. All right. <laughs> Child at heart, shall we say. At this time, I'd like to invite you to turn your attention to the screen. I've always wondered if I'd been at the stable that night. Would I have seen a king or just a baby? If I'd stood there with the shepherds listening to the stories about choirs of angels? Would I have asked? What child is this? Or would I have known that someday he would be the shepherd of all? If I'd watched wise men bring valuable gifts. And kneel down under the guard of heavenly wonders. Would I have understood that he'd be the one whom I'd find all wisdom? And that he was the greatest gift of all. Just as that baby was held by his mother. He would hold me. Me with his amazing grace. And his adoption by his father Joseph. Would be a picture of my adoption into God's family. Who could comprehend that this baby, who was defenseless. Swaddled and held. Would someday be the one holding me in his hands. I didn't witness a star moving across the skies. Or scores of angels proclaiming his birth. But somehow, in the middle of my ordinary world, this extraordinary baby's birth found a place in my worn down, beaten up heart. So like all those people who saw him, he's the one that I've been waiting for. To repair me. To redeem me. Love me. Forgive me. Comfort me. Help me. Die for me. Raise me to life. What child is this? He's the one who comes to save me. He's the one that comes to save me. To save me. To save me. He's the one that comes to save me. Imagine being there at the beginning. Being there at the beginning with, of creation with no, nothing there. A darkness beyond anything you and I could ever imagine, could ever comprehend. A void and an emptiness that is there unlike anything that can ever come to our mind. And into that void, into that emptiness, into that darkness, God says this. Let there be light. And there was light. It's interesting to me that at the beginning of creation, the very first thing God created was light. Without it, you could see, of course, none of the other parts of creation. And while the earth was formless and it was empty, God created this light and then he gave form to the universe. And then he began filling the universe with living things. In an orderly fashion, God began this creation process and he created everything until on the sixth day, on that last day of creation, when he reached the culmination of his creation, he created Adam and Eve. And God placed Adam and Eve into this, this crowning uh, achievement of his creation. He placed them in charge of everything that he had created. He gave them everything that they needed for a good and a rich and a full life. God then created 
Adam and Eve for a single purpose. God did not suddenly decide, well, you know, I've created, created everything. I've, I've kind of been creative. I made the platypus. You know, it's kind of an animal made up of spare, spare parts. You know, I mean, it looks different than everything else. I, I've created all this other stuff. I just want to create something different. No, he didn't come to that kind of a, of a decision. He created Adam and Eve for a very specific purpose. And the purpose of him creating Adam and Eve was so that he could have a relationship with them. That's his sole reason for, for creating them. And then not only did he create them to have a relationship with him, he didn't create them and just kind of set them out and say, I'll come see you every now and then. He created them not only to be in relationship with them, he wanted to be in intimate relationship with them. He, he wanted to have conversations with them. The scripture teaches us he would come and he would walk with them in the cool of the day. He hung out with them. God hung out with Adam and Eve. Could you imagine being Adam and Eve? Could you imagine being there with them at the beginning part of their creation? And in being there with them, can you imagine being able to see God's face every day? To communicate with him every day. To hear him speak to you every day. To talk with him and fellowship with him and be in relationship with him every day. Adam and Eve did not have to imagine it. They experienced it. And God enjoyed hanging out with him, with them. And God, he did everything he could to provide for Adam and Eve. And all he wanted was to be in a relationship with them. And he also wanted them to want to be in a relationship with him. Think about this. God told them that they could eat from anything and everything except for one tree. He told them that if they ate from that tree, that it would break the relationship that they had with him. And Adam, listen, it's not like God hid it from them. I used to go hunting on, a, I led a hunting retreat for about 15 to 20 years. And we'd go hunting on this man's land and, and have a retreat, just us guys. And it was a wonderful experience uh, that we were, we'd be able to be together. So we'd come, we'd read the Bible, we'd pray together, we'd hunt deer, and we'd come back and read the Bible and eat. And then pray that, you know, have a lesson and go hunt and come back and eat. And you kind of get the idea. All right. Uh, we were doing that. And w during our time out there, he started leasing his land to a uh, cattle rancher. And he came and gave us the lecture every year about being careful around the cows and, and you know, not mistaking a cow for a deer. And, and he, he also, he always said this. He said, now listen. The guy who's got this land leased, he's got a cow out there that's worth $10,000. And you'll know which one it is as soon as you shoot it. <laughs> you know, Adam and Eve didn't have to try to figure out all these fruit trees, all this stuff around. I wonder which tree God wants us to avoid. God loved Adam and Eve too much to lay, leave it up to chance and hope they didn't go to the wrong tree. He told them exactly which tree to avoid. They had no excuse. See, Adam and Eve, they deliberately and intentionally chose to eat that forbidden fruit. Now, I don't know what that fruit was. How many of you have heard it was an apple? Anybody here an apple? I, I've heard it was a pomegranate. I don't know where they got the pomegranate. I actually don't know where we got apple. I, I don't understand that either. Because the fruit is not mentioned. It just says it is forbidden. And since it's forbidden, they're supposed to avoid it. And while we don't know what fruit it was, Adam and Eve knew exactly what fruit that was, what tree that was. But to me, it's not, the, what kind of fruit is not at issue? The issue is that they chose something temporary that would destroy something eternal. Adam and Eve chose to a temporary full belly over their relationship with God. Think about that. They chose to sell out their relationship with God for a piece of fruit. 
And when they ate that fruit, Adam and Eve forever altered their relationship with God. God no longer walked with them in the garden. He no longer hung out with them in the cool of the day. That never happened again. And not only did he no longer hang out with them in the garden, he kicked them out of the garden. And so the garden and all the blessings that were once theirs were all removed from them as a consequence of the choice they made to disobey and disbelieve God. Adam and Eve learned that choices have consequences. You and I already understand that. Adam and Eve had to own the consequences of their choice to disobey God. God even warned them. I mean, like I said, it's not like God kept this a secret. He warned them. Look at what it says in Genesis 2. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Any. He said, They're all out here. You can eat from any. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for, you, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Hear this. Adam and Eve chose a course of action, and they had to deal with the consequences of their choice. And the same is true for me and you. See, listen, I firmly believe with everything that I have in me that God forgives us for every sin that we ask Him to forgive us for. Every sin. Doesn't matter what it is, God forgives us for us for, for it. No matter what you've done in your life, no matter what sin you've created, uh, you've committed, no matter what you have done that is wrong, God does not say, I'm, you've been too bad, forget it. God said, I will forgive you. I'm fully convinced of that. I'll tell you what else I'm fully convinced of. Even though God will fully forgive us for all of our sins, God will not save us always from the consequences of our sins. Let me give you an example. Does anybody know what the speed limit is on Woodbine Road? I mean, the real speed limit. Yeah. Not what everybody imagines it to be. 45, 45, that's what they say. I think there's a sign out at least once. Have you ever noticed that some people don't pay attention to that? There's one guy, he, he drives a, a, a sports bike. Don't know who he is. If, one of you, if it's one of you, we need to pray because I'm worried about you. Because <laughs> the only time he sees 45 is when he passes it climbing. I mean, he, he's so fast coming down the woodbine, and I haven't heard from him in a while. I hope he's okay. I really do, but I hadn't heard from him in a while. But he was so fast that if you were in his way, he'd just whip it over and pass you in the turn, turning lane. Another guy flies down through there and hadn't seen him in a while, but he, he, he has a, a muscle car kind of car, and, and, but you could hear him coming from a long ways off, and he, you know, it never, touched, never did anything but passed 45 going down Woodbine. Again, he passes you. If you're in his way, he'll just whip it over in the turn lane and keep going. Now, I will tell you this. I've seen them pass me, and I've, I've actually wished the police officer was down the street would stop him. <laughs> if that's wrong, forgive me. But it just, it was just flying. Well, I figured this out. If well, you and I, if we choose to be disobedient to the law and we choose to fly down Woodbine and we meet a deputy sheriff or a state trooper and they pull us over and guess what? It's too late to pray you don't get a ticket. There, you can't say to the state trooper or to the deputy sheriff, listen, I told Jesus to take the wheel. I just didn't know he was in this much hurry. Doesn't matter. While you may regret speeding, while you may be upset, you know, that you, 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 know you, you know you broke the law and you regret it, that does not mean you're going to be saved from the consequence of your decision to violate the law. Now, the state trooper or the police officer, they may very well be in a good mood and they may say, hey, I'll give you a break this time. Don't let me catch you again. Here's a warning. I wouldn't speed and bank on the break. 
You see, we have to realize we are, we're to be held responsible for our decisions that we make. Have you ever seen someone get mad at God whenever they got in trouble for something they did wrong? Yet they were wanting to blame God for it. Or have you ever seen someone try to blame somebody else for their sins and for what they've done wrong? Have you ever seen somebody do that? Listen, that's not new. We didn't invent this. Adam and Eve started it. God goes to Adam, said, hey, Adam, why'd you eat the fruit? That woman you gave me gave me the fruit. That's probably the last time he said that, but he said that. And then God goes to Eve, and he said, hey, Eve, why did you eat the fruit? Eve said, the serpent tempted me and made me eat the fruit. If you go back and read in Genesis where they ate the fruit, guess what? The serpent tempted Eve. She ate the fruit. Can you tell me where Adam was standing whenever Eve ate the fruit? Beside Eve. Go back and read it. Eve didn't take the fruit, eat it, and then go say, oh, well, that, you know, I need to give this to Adam. It says she turned and gave it to him. They chose deliberately to be in violation of what God had said not to do. I'm going to date myself a little bit here. Some of you are not going to know this character, but if you don't know him, you need to look him up. His name is Flip Wilson. Anybody here know Flip Wilson? Who said that? That's exactly it. Yeah. Flip Wilson had a character that was Geraldine. He played Geraldine. And anytime Geraldine would get in trouble, she said, well, the devil made me do it hey, all the time. No, that might make for good comedy. It makes for horrible theology because the devil does not make you do anything. If you choose to sin, you do it because you choose to do it, not because you, the devil made you do it. Now, that's just true. That is just the truth. When Adam and Eve chose their own course of action, they put God in a position where he had to choose. Listen, God keeps his promises. As a holy God, he could not tell Adam and Eve there would be no consequences for their disobedience, that there would be consequences for their disobedience and not follow through. I want to just ask the parents and grandparents in here just a question for just a minute. Parents, grandparents, listen. You go to your child, your grandchild, they do something wrong, you tell them, or you bring correction, that was wrong, don't do it again. You tell them, if you do that again, this is going to happen. Whatever this is. Time out, take away your device, uh, spanking, whatever it is you choose to discipline them. And you, and, and you tell them, you do this, this is going to happen. What happens if they do this and what you said is going to happen doesn't happen? They're not going to trust you, are they? They're going to believe they can get away with anything. They're going to believe that, well, they said not to do it. I, they didn't really mean that because I've already done it three times. Hadn't gotten in trouble yet. Yeah, they yelled a little bit, but that's it. You see, if whenever you don't follow through, you lose your credibility with your children or your grandchildren because they're no longer going to believe you're going to do what you say you're going to do. That's a harsh reality. God said, if you eat from this tree, you will die. He warned them. He told them what tree, and they disobeyed. You see, as a holy God, he had to respond in a way that was consistent with his perfect moral nature. He would not allow unchecked sin to go unpunished. You know, some people would say that the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin were pretty extreme. But listen, we need to remember that their sin set in motion our tendency to disobey God. And that is why we sin today. Adam and Eve's actions in the Garden of Eden 
plunged a perfect world into decay and chaos and conflict that still goes on today. Have y'all seen any conflict this year? Have you seen any decay and chaos this year? It's because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. See, we are all children of Adam and Eve, and we have all inherited their sin nature. I've, told, I've said this before. You do not teach a child to be bad. They learn that on their own because they're your child. Mine learned it from me and my wife because they're our children. We have a sin nature they inherited from us. You see, Adam and Eve's actions in the Garden of Eden caused all the chaos. Every human being born since Adam and Eve, with the exception of Jesus, inherited that sin nature. If you're ever looking for a good devotional book for Christmas, I know Christmas is tomorrow. I get that. There's always next Christmas, you know. You can read it after Christmas, too. It's still a good book. It's called The 25 Days of Christmas. It's by James Merritt, and he writes this. It says, from the moment Eve disobeyed, uh, disbelieved and disobeyed, everything and everyone has been infected by sin. Roses have thorns. Airports have metal detectors. Cities need cemeteries. And sin has poisoned more than the world around us. Why do we do the things we know we shouldn't, and why don't we do what we know we should? Something is wrong with our heart. You see, even though Adam and Eve, their sin was devastating, both for them and for us, we have good news because God does not let a problem go unsolved. I know you're sitting out there going, well, you know, Jimmy, we came tonight because it's Christmas Eve. And the reason we came tonight is, you know, this is a fun night and we have the live nativity and we sing Christmas carols. You know, we only get them for two or three Sundays out of the year. You know, we, we, we came for all of that. And you're talking about Adam and Eve and sin. What in the world does that have to do with Christmas? See, even in the midst of this devastating rejection of the relationship that Adam and Eve had with God, God chose to set in motion a plan to restore his relationship with humanity. The promise of Christmas came in the Garden of Eden. Listen. <laughs> a lot of people think that you find the Christmas story, it begins and we, it's first mentioned in the Bible in Matthew or in Luke or you know, book of the New, books of the New Testament. That, that's not true. The first mention of the Christmas story is not in the books of the New Testament. After all, what is the Christmas story? Isn't the Christmas story the story of God sending His Son to be our Savior? I mean, isn't it the story of God's Son coming to earth to redeem us and to restore us and restore the broken relationship we have with Him? Isn't that the purpose of Christmas? We first learn about the Savior, not in Matthew and not in Luke, but in Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. God speaking to the serpent after the sin that, was cre what, uh, uh, cre that happened with Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3, 14, it says, So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. We think about that and we might miss the meaning of that passage if we're, if we're not careful. See, God was talking about our enemy in these verses. And our, our enemy is Satan. And Satan will do everything he can to try to destroy your life. He'll hold nothing back to try to destroy you. God knew that. And when the writer of Genesis said that the serpent will strike his heel, God was talking about Satan's repeated attempts to defeat Jesus during his time on earth. And the phrase, he shall crush your head, is a promise given to Satan from God that Satan's not going to win. 
Satan was completely defeated when Jesus rose from the dead. My granny, she only wore shoes if she was going two places. She wore shoes when she was going to the store and when she was going to church. Other than that, rain or shine, sleet, snow, it did not matter. She always was barefooted. Always was barefooted. Y'all, y'all know what sweet gum balls are? Y'all know how painful those things are if you step on it with your bare foot? You got sweet gum balls, you got acorns, you got uh, uh, pecans. They're all out in the yard, didn't bother her. She could walk right across them. <laughs> she had to walk down her gravel driveway to get to her mailbox. She did it barefooted. She worked her garden, garden barefooted. Listen, I believe God made shoes for a reason. I don't do barefooted. I mean, I don't even do barefooted in my house that much. I, I have on socks if I don't. Uh, listen, I have house shoes. I know that might not sound very manly, but hey, guess what? I've stepped on a Lego. <laughs> you ever step on a Lego? That'll make you say your Sunday school lesson. I mean, <laughs> man, that hurts. It's painful to my foot. I've stepped on a rock. It's painful to my foot. I've never known of anybody dying from stepping on a Lego. There have been a lot of people who died from getting hit in the head with a rock. You see, getting struck on your heel is not deadly. Getting your head crushed is. <laughs> Don't miss this. Mere moments after sin separated Adam and Eve for, from God, God set in motion His plan to redeem us. Not years later, not a long time later, right there, He set in motion. He said to the serpent, whenever He found out, He found out, listen, God already knew it, but whenever the, you know, he, he was addressing the serpent and said, you're going to try to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. That's the beginning of God's plan of salvation right then. Genesis 3.15 is the first verse in the Bible to tell us of a Savior who would bring salvation from our sin, who would save us from our sin, and who would restore our relationship with our God. See, the promise of Christmas came in the Garden of Eden. But the fulfillment of Christmas came in a stable in Bethlehem. You got that sleepy little town of Bethlehem. On a night that seemed like every other night. And on that night, something that would change all of history happened. A promise that was made in Genesis was kept. On that special night, God fulfilled what he had told to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the promise that so many people had been expecting for millions of uh, for, for thousands of years was fulfilled, not in a military leader, not in a political leader, but it was fulfilled in a baby born in a barn and laid in a feed trough. Angels came to announce his birth to shepherds. Oh, I read this verse a few minutes ago, and I might have read it too fast, and we might have missed this message. I want to make sure we get it. And Luke 2.11 says this. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Did you catch that? The very first word... Used to describe this newborn baby is Savior. It's right there in white and blue. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. The angel didn't say, there's this cute little kid, and you might confine him with his family. You know, he's going to be a pretty good guy, and eventually he's going to do some great things. No, he said his first definition, his first description is Savior. I 
I mean, that, this is exactly what the world had been waiting for since Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Let's look on. Let's look at these verses one more time from Luke. In Luke 2, Luke writes this. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. <laughs> Can you imagine the excitement on these shepher in, with these shepherds? Can you imagine that? I mean, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I talked about the shepherds. I had a sermon about the shepherds. And what was very interesting is this. They got the message in the middle of the night. And they left from the message in the middle of the night in the middle of a field to go into the middle of the town in the middle of the night when everybody else is sleeping to find a baby in a barn. And once they found that baby in that barn, they fell before him and worshipped him. And they were so excited that they had found the Savior that the angel had told them about. They started telling everybody right then. They're going, wake up. Wake up. I got something to tell you. The Savior is here. Wake up. The Savior is here. Come on out. The Savior is here. He is here. Come on out. Hey, they were telling everybody the Savior had been born. Hey, just down here. Go down here. Turn left. He's in that barn. <laughs> or turn right, depending on what direction they were. You know, he was in the barn. The Savior is here. They were so excited that the Savior is here. <laughs> Don't miss this. God does not do stuff that doesn't need to be done. So if we didn't need a Savior, He wouldn't have gone to all the effort and trouble to send us one. But the fact that He sent a Savior to earth means that we need one whether we realize it or not. Have you ever had anybody ask you, what does it mean to be saved? Are you saved? Have you ever had anybody ask you that? What does it mean to be saved? To be saved, another word for saved is a synonym. It says to be rescued, to be delivered, to be set free. You see, we need a Savior. And the good news is He's here. Jesus' earthly father, listen to this, before Jesus was born... Before Joseph knew he was going to be an adoptive father. Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, was told these words in a dream. Matthew records, it says, She, Mary, will give birth to a son, and you are to give him, you, Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Here it is. Because he will save his people from their sins. You know what sin is? Sin is not just a mistake we make. Sin is an attitude. Sin is an intentional disobedience of, God, from, of what God has told us to do. Sin causes us to say things like, I want to be my own boss. I don't need God. God, you go do your thing and I'll go over here and do my thing. Listen. We need a Savior, and He's here. He's here to save us from that. He want, because of that kind of self-centeredness, we need that Savior. See, the Bible says that every one of us has this sin attitude in our lives. Every one of us. Every, listen, every problem we have in life is caused because of sin. Every problem. Sin causes confusion, guilt, shame, regret, bitterness, resentment, grudges, worry, fear, discouragement, anxiety, emptiness, despair, conflict between two people. 
Every single one of our problems is caused because we're not connected to God. But the good news is that even though we need a Savior, He's here. He's here. See, as a result of sin, Jesus said, I want to set you free. I want to release you. I want to save you. Listen. I want to be real with you. Those, all of you that are in this room, all those listening online, I want to be real with you. Maybe there's some of you that have never realized you need a Savior. Maybe you've been looking for that one thing that's going to give you fulfillment and meaning and peace in your life. And you hadn't found it. The problem is you're looking in the wrong place. That's why you're so frustrated. And what Jesus wants to say to you right now, he wants to say this. He said, I can replace your frustration in your heart with peace. I can, I can replace the guilt and the resentment and the shame and the grudges with forgiveness. I can replace the worry and the anxiety in your heart with confidence and with faith. I, I can, Jesus says, I can replace that despair with hope. I can replace that emptiness with meaning and with purpose. But I'm not going to break down the door of your heart. You're going to have to let me in. How many of you have ever seen the picture? I, I should have had it up on the screen. You could see it. It's a picture of Jesus. You know, somebody, it's great this Artist painted this picture and has a picture of Jesus at the standing at a door with his hand up knocking on it. You ever seen that picture? Google it. Just Jesus knocking at the door. It'll come up real easy. Uh, Google it later. All right. But I'll go. You look at that picture. Do you know what's missing? I'm not going to wait. Let, let you, you know, make you wait and find out. I'll tell you what's missing. What's missing is a doorknob. Jesus is on the outside. He's knocking on the door. But you have to open the door to let him in. He's not going to kick the door down. He's not going to force his way in. He's knocking, asking, can he come in? Now, if you open the door, he'll walk in. But until you open the door in your life to him, he's not going to walk in. He's a gentleman. While he doesn't agree with your choice, he will respect it. But he'll keep knocking. He'll keep knocking. You know, we started this message today talking about the choice Adam and Eve made to break their relationship with God. And we saw how God promised a Savior to restore that broken relationship. And, and we have seen that delivery of that promise was made on that first Christmas when our Savior was born in Bethlehem. So it comes down to this, and I, I just want to ask you, is there something in your life that is hindering you from a relationship with God? Do you need God to deliver you from something? Do you need to be delivered from your sin and accept Jesus as your Savior? You see, God did not send Jesus to give us religion. He sent Jesus so you could have a personal relationship with God. The question is, Will you accept that gift? I want to invite you to do something. I'm going to invite you to just bow your head and close your eyes. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or stand up or anything like that. But I do want to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute. And I want to invite you to I just answer this question honestly. Do you need to be delivered from your sin? Do you need to be set free? 
If you want to be delivered from a life of sin, if you want to be delivered and forgiven for your sin and start a new life right now, I want to invite you to do that. Just between you and Jesus, I want to invite you to pray this very simple prayer. I'll lead you in the prayer, but in your own words, you just pray it just between you and Him. You can remember this prayer with four simple words. The first one is sorry. God, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I'm sorry I've rejected you up to this point in my life. The second word is please. Please forgive me of my sins. Please save me. Please deliver me from the sin that's in my life. Please come into my life and be my Lord. And the last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. Thank you for always giving me another chance. Thank you for Jesus. Father, for those who have prayed that prayer for the first time today in minute, I pray that you would work in their life in a very powerful way. I pray that they would be drawn to you day in and day out. And whatever it is, Lord, that keeps trying to hinder them in their growth, that you would just deliver them from that. For others who are already Christ followers, they may have been Christ followers for a while. But Lord, right now they need to be delivered from something that's hindering their relationship with you right now in their life. If that's who you are, if you're already a Christ follower, but there's something that's blocking you, there's something that's hindering you and messing with your relationship with Jesus, turn that over to Him right now. Ask Him to deliver you. Father, we thank You. We thank You that You never, ever, ever give up on us. And we thank You that You sent Jesus to deliver us and set us free. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. For this time when we're doing our candlelight service, at the be- I want to remind you that at the beginning of the message that we talked about the first thing that God created was the light. And he's brought that light into a dark world to overcome the darkness. And during this candlelight, what I want to invite you to do, I want you to be reminded that God sent Christ to be the light of the world. He sent Christ to shine light into your darkness and show you the way. And He also sent us as Christ followers to be reflections of His light in this world. So just as in creation, His light overcomes darkness, let this time of candlelight be a time of reflection when we reflect on God's outrageous plan of salvation that He gives to you and I. invite those who are going to assist me to please come to the bottom of the steps there as we get ready to uh, have uh, light your candle we have these four folks who are going to come down the aisles they're going to light the candles and you just spread the light on over and as your candle is lit I invite you to stand as we get ready to sing silent night
At creation, God said, let there be light, and light shone into the darkness. A few thousand years later, he kept his promise by sending a Savior. He said, let there be light, and a Savior was born in Bethlehem. We celebrate that. On behalf of myself and my staff and the people of Woodbine Church, we want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. And we want to invite you to help us out a little bit with our closing prayer. Our closing prayer is going to be singing the first verse of Joy to the World. And after we get finished singing that, you can blow out your candles and there will be somebody at the door with uh, baskets. You can just drop them in there as you're getting ready to leave. And also, don't forget our box out there that Autumn put together for us for our offering for our children's home. But on behalf of all of us, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. Let's lift our voices. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven. Merry Christmas. God bless you.